Welcome to the third presentation in our series of presentations regarding queen bee rearing and breeding. In this presentation, I delve into the various methods of raising queens and some of the other information that's important to know before you get into trying to produce your own queens. First, I'll talk about why you even raise your own queens at all, the differences between queen rearing versus queen breeding, some of the natural queen rearing methods and some of the historical non-grafting methods. I'll talk about the grafting method developed by Doodle, which most queen bee producers now use. The timing, that's very important to keep track of when you graft your cells, when your queens may emerge, and so on. Discuss the types of cell starters and cell finishers that are available. And then finally, the setup and management of these cell builders. So why raise your own queens at all? You can just buy queens like everyone else. Well, there's many reasons for raising queens, and one of them is cost. Not only the cost of purchasing the, purchasing the queen herself, but also shipping and then replacement if she's not accepted. There's availability. If you raise your own queens, it's easy to keep a few backup queen, queens on hand in a nuke just in case. You know, if you uh, accidentally kill a queen or you have a queen that's failing and you don't have your own queens, you need to order one in. It might take a week or two and you don't know, you know, there's no guarantee as to the quality of that queen. Whereas if you ha raise your own queens, at least during the summer, during the queen rearing season, you have plenty of queens on hand as backup. Selection. You can breed the kind of queen bees and the type of bees that you want. Bees that are locally adapted to your environment those with mite or disease resistance, and then you can avoid unwanted genetics, such as uh, Africanized genetics and other genetics you may not want. It's a source of income. You know, you can make income selling honey um, at a farmer's market or whatnot, uh, but locally raised queens can be in high demand. And at least for myself, I find that it's easier for me to uh, generate income from my sideline bee breeding business than it is uh, simply for, from selling honey. And then quality. You can be assured that the queen bees that you raise will be the best quality, the highest quality possible. And then the final reason is it's fun. I really enjoy raising queens. Uh, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, I, I think every beekeeper should try at least a few times. And for some of you, you know, this might become part of your, uh, of your beekeeping adventure. Quote Kim Flottam, the editor of Bee Culture, as Mark Twain might have said, the difference between queens you buy and queens you raise yourself is almost the difference between light and lightning. Well, let's get into the differences between queen rearing and queen breeding. A lot of us use these terms interchangeably, uh, and you certainly can do so. Queen rearing is the process of producing queens for replacement or for sale, uh, propagation. You're basically just producing queens. You're not really doing any selection uh, so much. Whereas queen breeding is breeding honeybees, not only raising and producing queens, but also selecting for bees that may have specific desirable characteristics in they and their offspring, basically selecting uh, the stock that you will breed from and hopefully their offspring will display more of the char those characteristics that you are looking for. The basic requirements for raising queens, first you need a breeder queen, a mother queen from which you will select newly hatched larva uh, to raise new queen bees from, a cell starter or finisher with a large population of young nurse bees to raise those cells into queens, there needs to be plenty of resources, incoming pollen and nectar, or you need to be feeding them. Lots of unrelated drones for mating with the virgin queens when they go on their mating flights. Good weather, specifically warm, sunny weather, ideally not very windy, so the queens and drones can fly to the drone congregation areas to mate. And then a place where you need to put those newly emerged queens into uh, while they're getting ready and going on mating flights. And typically we use mating nukes or sometimes queen castles. There are different methods of rearing queens. 
the bees raised their own queens like for as long as there have been uh, bees that existed. Uh, you can still do that, although it's harder to raise uh, large numbers of queens. Some of the first methods of raising queens were non-grafting methods. Uh, you can encourage the bees to raise queens and queen cells through manipulation of the hive or the queen. And then finally, there's grafting method. Uh, that's the method that is preferred by most queen producers, but some folks, those who uh, maybe have a tremor, poor vision, or only want to raise a, a dozen or so queens per year, maybe you don't necessarily need to learn how to do that. But I, I, I strongly encourage you not to be scared off, you know, by, uh, you know, the process. It, it is something that almost anyone can learn. Well, in natural queen rearing, you might use a, a swarm cell that you. Uh, pulled off. Now this obviously is not a swarm cell, this is a grafted cell that I, I have, but you could also find swarm cells on a on a comb or a supersedure cell and you could um, take that comb, put that into a new split that you've made and uh, that queen will emerge just as she would naturally and eventually she'll mate and, and hopefully come back to the colony and, and then you'll have a new hive and a mated queen. Um, or you can do what we call walk away splits. I'll talk about more of these in, in a moment. And then there's the various uh, numerous non-grafting methods, which I'll talk about in, in greater detail. And finally, the, the grafting method that was developed by Doolittle. Let's talk about natural queen rearing. Basically, the bees themselves have decided to raise some queen cells. And you can use the cells from that, that were from bees that are deciding to swarm. Uh, or if you find super seizure cells, those are usually very high quality cells. And if you have extra, you might use them to replace uh, as a way to replace a queen that needs to be re a colony needs to be requeened. Um, you can either transfer the entire comb to the colony new, new queen, or if if you have a comb that maybe does not have plastic foundation but it's wax foundation, you can carefully cut it out. Um, with lots of wax at the base and very carefully so you don't damage that uh, take it and put it into another colony perhaps uh, fix it to the face of the comb using toothpicks or some other method so that it, it stays in place now there's a lot of beekeepers who love walk away splits uh, I have some issues with them. I'm not against them, but I, I guess I see walkaway splits being done poorly too often by new beekeepers. Certainly they can be done and they can be done effectively, uh, but you really have to be paying attention to what you're doing. I, I call it, instead of a walkaway split, I call it a walkaway and then walk back a few days later to make sure that the, the split was done right. Essentially they need to have one frame at least of resources such as honey, couple of frames of capped and emerging brood, frame with eggs and newly hatched larvae, and then a frame with pollen. Obviously some of these frames can have a little bit of all of these things. And then you need to shake in enough extra bees to cover that brood. And then because it's a new colony that you started, uh, often you need to feed syrup uh, for the first few weeks, especially if there's no uh, ongoing honey flow. Uh, the thing that a lot of new beekeeper do though is they they make up their walk away splits and then they don't come back and they're making them in the same yard where the you know where the bees and comb originally came from and a lot of them end up flying back and then sometimes i've seen some of these walk away splits that have maybe like a cup of bees in there and that's not enough to succeed to even raise that brood or be successful so if you're going to do a walk away split you know please walk back you know a few days later to look if uh if there's still enough bees in there and if not shaken some more um, ideally, the, the, the safest way to do this is to make them up and then take them to another yard or location, you know, three miles away or more so they won't fly back. But that's the main issue I have with walkaway splits. Not that they don't work, but I, I've seen them done poorly so many times. Uh, so make sure that there's enough bees in there. It really should be covering all those combs. Advantage, uh, you know, it's easy. You don't have to have any skills. You don't have to know how to do queen re uh, re rearing. Uh, you can use it to make splits to increase your number of colonies. It can be helpful uh, during, especially during swarm season, uh, a way to prevent your full-size production colonies from swarming. By making uh, these splits, you are reducing the population in the original colony and you're making new colonies at the same time. But some of the issues, the queens might not be of as high quality, especially if there wasn't as many bees put in there. Um, if there's not enough nurse bees, some of the brood may die. And then it might take up to a month before the queen is made in laying. And if that queen fails, you know, that colony pretty much is going to fail. So you probably just best reunite it back to the original colony. 
I've had uh, customers call me wanting a queen. They tried to make a walkaway split. It failed, and now they want to put a new queen in there. And, you know, I say it's these bees are old now. And, sure, if you're going to put some new comb in there with some new brood and there's still bees, then you could do it that way. But if you're going to just use the original walkaway split with the old bees and try to put in a, a – introduce a queen with a cage, that maybe is not the best uh, approach for you to do. Again, I'm not a, I'm not against walkaway splits. I'm just – I've seen them done uh, – sub you know not not suboptimally not the best way and and then they don't end up not being as successful the non-grafting methods of raising queen uh were discovered and learned uh first before uh we learned how to graft uh larva to make queens uh, dr dr miller uh, began beekeeping almost act accidentally after his wife captured a swarm. Eventually, he gave up his medical practice and de dedicated his whole life to raising queens. And the Miller method can raise about 9 or 12 queens at a time. Basically, the way that it works is a frame with some foundation is put into the hive, the mother hive, where you want to get the, the eggs and the brood. Um, after a week, uh, it the 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 queen is removed um but these combs are removed and then they're cut off at these angles and at the edges is where the queen cells you want them to begin uh raising uh the queens from this and so the cell builder ha should be queenless for at least 24 hours before you put that frame into the uh cell builder uh to begin raising queen cells and I'll talk more about what cell builders are and how to set them up and and all of that in a, in another presentation so by day eight, the, the comb has been drawn out, and there are eggs and young larvae. And this, the, the pictured frame is plastic foundation because it's easy to look at. That's not how you're, you're not going to use plastic foundation. You're going to use foundation that is wax because it's easy to cut. Uh, so you're not going to use plastic foundation, brood foundation, like is pictured in this photo. But it is easy to look at so that you can see for your, for your, with your eyes much easier than if it was uh, yellow beeswax. And you want to trim the comb off, the, trim the foundation off right where the eggs are, right at the edge of where the eggs have been laid and where they're hatching. And you want to remove two-thirds of the egg and larva. So where the red line is, you'll either use a, a twig or a match stick or the edge of your hive tool to remove those eggs and larva. So that way there's a little bit of space. You don't want those queen cells when they're drawn out to be touching each other because it'll be very difficult to cut them out and put them into wherever you're going to put those queen cells. And 10 days later, so this has been put into a queenless colony, a queenless cell builder. 10 days later, the queen cells should have be uh, uh, drawn out and capped. And now they're sturdy enough that and you can cut them out gently and put them into their own colony, whether it's a full-size colony where you remove the queen to uh, be requeened or into individual mating nukes. And then you can pin them using toothpicks onto the face of the comb. And this is just another way to look at what these will look like. And some of them are might be so close to each other, it might you might not be able to separate them. And that's fine. You can cut out two or three at a time and put them into the into the mating nuke. And here's a picture showing how toothpicks were used to put the uh, uh, cell uh, onto the face of the comb. Obviously, if you put this back into a hive, you're going to need to have space so you don't smush it. And so you might need to have removed a, a frame to give a little extra space and leave a gap, at least until that queen cell emerges. And then you can, uh, you know, after she emerges, then you can put the extra frame in and remove this. Another non-grafting method is, is similar to uh, the Miller method that we talked about, but rather than cutting the frame of comb, instead strips of comb with young larvae and newly hatching eggs are are basically affixed or placed or attached to the bottom of, of a comb facing downward so the bees will naturally uh, begin to raise queens. And again, you're going to have to put these into a queenless colony so this happens. If you just do this in the original colony, nothing's going to happen because you know they're not really interested in raising queens if they already have one. And Jay Smith published his book about using these strips, which popularized this in uh, in the mid-1900s, but it was discovered originally by Allie in, in the late 1800s. Basically, the strips are cut out uh, with the eggs or newly hatching larvae, and then they can be put on the bottom of a comb, or, or in this picture, they're put on a cell bar, and usually attached using some uh, melted wax. Again, two out of every three cells are destroyed between each cell where one is left, so that when the cells are drawn out, they're not all touching each other, and it's easier to cut them off. And basically, they're gently cut off, 
and then put into the mating nuke or hive where you want them to emerge and uh, the virgin queens go on their mating flights. A variation of the Ali Smith method, rather than cutting out strips of, of comb, and again, this is always going to be done with wax foundation, not with plastic, but a, a, a variation is to use a punch to remove one cell that has an egg or a, or a newly hatched larva in there. That way you don't have to scoop it out as in grafting, and you can take those and uh, you can put them onto the bottom of a cell bar, the same as you would with the Ali method. These cell bars could even be the same one where you might put grafted queen cells if you want to. You can certainly find them through beekeeping supply uh, companies. And using melted wax, they are affixed to the cell bar and then placed into the cell builder, the same as the Ali Smith method. Other non-grafting methods, more modern, are using these cassettes with plastic cups and there's a cage placed over and the queen is placed into this so that she can't lay eggs anywhere else and so she will lay eggs into these cups so that you don't have to transfer the larva as in grafting. She's left in there for an amount of time and of course it's put back into the hive so that the worker bees can go in there and care for her, uh, feed her and then any larva that might begin hatching they, they can begin feeding them. After the eggs hatch, the plugs are removed and placed into queen cell cups. Uh, but you don't want to leave that queen in there too long. She'll start laying multiple eggs into each cell. So basically, you leave her long enough to where there's an egg in each cell, and then you release her. The advantages, you do get uh, queen cells the same as if you grafted them, but you don't actually have to use grafting. So if you have poor eyesight or don't have dexterity, you have a tremor or you know bad uh, you know arthritis or something like that. This method can certainly uh, be helpful in that scenario. Sometimes the queen doesn't want to lay into the cell cups. I know some beekeepers have used this method who have had issues with supersedure. You know, it's not natural for the queen to be confined, even for just a few days, into a small area. And the bees dis mistake this loss of new brood during these few days as the queen is failing and we need to replace her. So you need to pay attention um, if you see supersedure cells afterwards. That's, that that might, have, might happen because of this. Then there's the Hopkins method. I've tried all of these non-grafting methods, and even though I prefer grafting as my method of raising queens, if I had to use a method that did not involve grafting, I would be using the Hopkins method. It was developed by a New Zealand beekeeper, Isaac Hopkins, and published in the early 1900s. Um, it remained relatively unknown until an article was published in, the, in 1984 in the ABJ. All new, all wax comb is placed into the queen mother colony. Uh, right in the middle of the brood nest. The queen is allowed to lay eggs in there and four days later is checked and if uh, there's enough then it is removed to be placed on top of the queenless cell starter colony. Similar to the other methods, two out of three cells are destroyed. Now unlike uh, Miller or Alley where you just go down each one, you're going to be using the whole comb and so you have to go uh, using a nail or the edge of a high t hive tool or a little stick to basically take out rows of colonies all at once. And it seems more confusing to explain than it is to show. But basically you go down one group of diagonals, taking two at a time, and then you go the other direction. And you will be leaving the cells with the eggs and larvae so that they're separated with enough wax. And this is so you will be able to cut out these cells after they're drawn out. Then the comb is placed horizontally, facing downward over the top of the brood nest of the queenless cell starter with a shim, so there's enough space over it. Now in cooler weather, in early spring, you may have to put some kind of insulation or something, but in the warmer summer months, the bees will come up and cover this and it won't be a problem. About 10 days later, you check on it and the ripe queen cells will be facing downward and you can cut each of those out individually and using a, a toothpick, you can affix it to the comb of wherever colony you're going to want that queen to emerge uh, and then, then to become mated. Now my preferred method of raising queens is grafting. It is a skill. It takes a little bit of, of skill and a little bit of time to learn. But once you learn how to do it, it's really not as hard. Like any other uh, skill, you know, it, it, it takes a little bit to learn. But once you learn how, then, you, you know, you're, you're going to really uh, 
not you know you'll you that's gonna for many of you will be your preferred method. It was developed by uh, Gilbert Doolittle in uh, New York State in the mid 1800s. He was a, a prolific writer and author and wrote many books and articles about queen rearing, including about his method uh, using artificial queen cell cups. Back then, they were created uh, out of wax. Uh, now, many of us use uh, plastic cups that are commercially available through beekeeping supply companies. Essentially, young larvae, 12 to 24 hours, are carefully removed from a worker cell, placed into a queen cell cup, and these cups are placed onto a bar within a frame. That frame with the queen cell cups are placed into a cell starter hive, queenless cell starter hive, for the bees to feed into larvae and create queen cells. Then, 10 days later after grafting, they are placed into the mating nukes. Now I'm going to talk a lot more about the grafting method and specifics in another presentation, but I'm going to take a break from that because I've been throwing around a lot of uh, words and things about timing and dates and cell builders and cell starters, and I want to go more into that. Um, I will much more uh, detailed coverage of the cover the uh, queen uh, cell grafting method um, in another uh, presentation in this series. So let's talk about some other uh, topics, and these apply to all methods of queen uh, rearing, whether you decide to use grafting or non-grafting methods. One thing that's important is to keep track of dates. It's important to keep track of the dates so you know certain things. You know when the queen cells are, are old enough and tough enough to be able to be safely handled without damaging them so that you can move them into the mating nukes or into your queen cell incubator. You know when the queens are so when the queens will be ready to emerge. If you uh, don't pay attention to this, and the first queen emerges, uh, she'll often go down the line and kill every single one of your other cells. It's an expensive mistake. Uh, we all have to learn that mistake sometimes more than once. So that you also so that you know when your queens will go on their mating flights, when you should be expecting to see eggs after they've mated and began laying. And then finally, you know, when those queens will be ready to be caught and put in cages so you can, you know, put them into their new hive or if you're going to be selling them uh, to other beekeepers so know when they'll be ready to be sold. And like I said, if you don't keep track of dates, sometimes the first queen will emerge a little early and then go down and kill all your other queen cells. A lot of us like to, to uh, keep track of a calendar. So day four after the egg was laid is when the larva is 24 hours, so she is ready to be grafted in, into the cell starter. We would call that day zero if you're paying attention to grafting day because that's the day that you graft. Another important day to be aware of is day nine to 10 after grafting because that's when those ripe queen cells are ready to be moved into their mating nukes, but before the queens have emerged. And then finally, about 14 days after you place those, place those cells into the mating nukes, which is now about 30 days after the egg was laid, that's when the queens should have mated and begun laying eggs. Now, if there was some bad weather, you, you might have to wait a little bit longer before you see those first eggs. You can keep track of it through a calendar. The same way, keeping track of when the larva was grafted, when it's time to put those cells into the mating nuke, and then when the queens begin laying. Uh, there's these uh, cards sometimes that can help you calculate it. Or I really like uh, some of the calculators that are available online. This uh, ca calendar uh, from the uh, beekeepers of the Susquehanna Valley, if you Google it, you can find it, and it'll generate a calendar just for you so you can keep track of dates. Now, I've thrown around the term cell starters and cell builders uh, earlier in this presentation. Essentially, they are colonies where the larva that has been either grafted or larva that's in some cells that are going to be raising the queens through the non-grafting methods are placed so that the bees can raise them into queen cells uh, so that later we can have those to put into um, the mating nukes or hives wherever they're going to go. Uh, Many of these terms are used sort of interchangeably, but there are some slight differences. 
And there's almost as many ways to make up your cell starter and finisher as there are methods of raising queens. And all of us have our preferred methods. As you raise queens over time, you will learn and and decide that some some methods of making your cell starter finisher is better than others or better at certain times of the year. Essentially, a cell starter is a colony, usually without a queen or open brood, where your grafts are, are placed to be accepted and fed royal jelly. So this is where the bees begin the process of converting that newly hatched larva that would have been a worker had it been left alone uh, instead into a queen bee. The cell finisher is a colony where the accepted grafts, after they've been started to be raised into queen cells, are moved 24 hours or so later to be finished, to be completed. The larvae are fed a lot more royal jelly and then they're capped. Now some beekeepers, including myself, use uh, the same colony to be the cell starter and finisher. And to clarify that, I just call it a cell builder. So basically it is the starter and the finisher in one. I, and if you use, you can use these terms, and I, you know, we all know, what, we'll know what you're talking about. But that's these are the definitions of some of the terms that I've been using it earlier on um, when I talk about a cell starter or cell finisher or cell builder. No matter what method you choose, the most important thing is for your cell starter finisher builder to have a large population of healthy nurse bees because nurse bees are what produce royal jelly and those bees that colonies be well supplied with food not only syrup but also uh, protein or incoming pollen because that's the pollen and protein is what the, they use to produce royal jelly uh, if you think you have enough bees in there but you're not sure it's always best to add more you want them literally to be overflowing so that when you open the cell builder up you can you can barely put the top on you have you know otherwise you're gonna squash a lot of bees this is a very busy slide I am not going to read through all of these you know you guys would fall asleep um, but basically it's it's contrasting and showing you the different types of methods that there are uh, for uh, producing, you know, queen cells and cell starters, finishers, and builders. I'm going to go through and talk about some of these individually, uh, but there are many different methods that have been, uh, you know, d developed over the years. The swarm box is uh, basically a, an artificial swarm. So young bees have been shook into a a box typically it's a five or six frame box without a queen or open brood it's very important not to have open brood present because they might decide to use that to raise the queen cells and not the the beautiful grafts that you provided for it but they're only used to start the grafts it's not strong enough to for finishing the cells the advantages um, you can do this in any kind of weather I mean it, in the early season I can do this even if there's a snowstorm outside I just put the the swarm box into the barn um, and they're easily movable and, and they're e easy to transport queen cells. But you have to do, use multiple manipulations and of course confining bees into a box is not natural so they are a bit stressed and they're only uh, able to be used over the short term. Most commonly we use a five frame nuke box that's been converted typically with a screened in portion on the bottom to accommodate more bees. You shake in nurse bees from combs of open brood uh, from the donor colonies Obviously, making sure you're not accidentally shaking in a queen, because if there's a queen in there, they're not going to want to accept your grafts. Uh, the grafts are placed into the swarm box uh, 2 to 24 hours later. And after they've been accepted and they're able to be drawn out, then you take the accepted grafts into whatever colony that you're going to be using to finish those. And then the bees in the, shook, in the swarm box are shook back to the original hive or maybe an, an, another hive that requires an a, you know, increase in population. So another method of starting queen cells other than the swarm box is the queenless cell starter, but it's a colony that's free flying. So they're able to, to fly freely uh, and, and that those bees are a bit less stressed out because it's like a normal colony except for the fact that they are queenless. Uh, they're started in the cell starter and then 24 hours later, the same as the swarm box, they're moved to another colony for finishing. Advantages, no extra equipment. I mean, you're using just regular full size uh, bee hive equipment. Uh, the downside is you have to remove the queen or separator some way. Uh, it only works with very strong colonies unless you're going to be shaking in extra nurse bees from other colonies. And it requires a second set of colonies for cell finishing. 
Another option is to use the same colony for both starting and finishers. So this would be a cell builder, and the queen is kept separate from the graphs via a queen excluder. Um, there's many methods and variations of this that have been developed over time as well. Queen quality is, is excellent. You know, the, the bees have some the queen below, um, and it's possible to put in a few graphs every day. The downside, though, is it's a very highly populated colony, and if you have a queen in the lower box, they might say, hey, we're raising queens, it's swarm season, we might swim out, uh, swarm out on you. And the other disadvantage is during a dearth or later in this year, the bees might realize, you know, this is not a time to swarm. So they might, the bees themselves might take down your queen cells. And then there's the queenless starter, queen right finisher. So the cells are started in a queenless starter for better acceptance. You know, if there's no queen pheromone within the starter colony, uh, you'll have better acceptance. But then 24 hours later, you move them to a, a queen right finisher, or somehow you make that, that's, that hive that was queenless queen right. And that's sort of how the cloakboard method works. But we'll, we'll get to that here in a moment. Advantages, it's optimal balance between uh, cell acceptance and queen quality. Uh, but you need a very strong colony and they may not finish uh, very well during a dearth or certain times of the year. This is my preferred method of starting and finishing queens uh, because it, it's kind of getting the best of both worlds. So using a cell builder, you, you're making them temporarily queenless to start and then you're allowing them to be queen right to finish. So the queen is kept below a, a a uh, excluder with a young brood and open comb to wait lay eggs. The grafts are placed above that queen excluder and then you can separate that using a cloak board. Basically there's a, a board that slides in and out and during the time that you're making the you're putting in those grafts the metal slide is put in the queen is below the queen excluder and so the, col the bees that are above think, oh, we're queenless, and they will accept those no problem. After 24 hours, you can remove the board, and now it's a queen right colony with the full colony of bees. And like I said, it tends to work best earlier in the year during the swarm season, later in the year not so much. And then another method, the free-flying queenless cell builder. So it's queenless throughout the whole process. It's uh, They will accept no matter what, um, but you're going to have to support that colony because uh, you know they're not producing their own bees. And I tend to use this later in the year. When the dearth hits later in the season, uh, the, the queenless starter, queen right finisher method doesn't work so well. So I tend to use the queenless cell builder all around. And at the end of the year, I might unite these bees in this queenless cell builder back with a colony that's weak, or you could just uh, use it, put a queen cell in there, and just let it requeen itself, and then eventually you just have a new colony out of it. One thing that's been discussed a lot is queen quality, and I have a whole presentation about that later in this series of presentations. Uh, but one question is, is there any difference in the size and the quality of queen cells depending on what type of cell starter or finisher is used? And there's been a lot of debate about this. You know how beekeepers love to argue. So different studies have showed different things, but uh, these colonies, some studies have shown that there is not a significant difference from the weight of uh, queen cells or pupa that were raised in queenless colonies versus queen right. Uh, another study showed no difference between the weights of the pupa reared on the top grafting bars versus those on the lower bars. Uh, however, they did find the length of queen cells re raised in the queenless colony was significantly greater than in the queen right colony. So qu the size of queen cells may predict the size ultimately of the queens. But even though the queen cells were longer in the queenless colony, the weight of the pupa themselves really was no different. So I'm just leaving this information for what it's worth. Uh, there might not be any difference as far as we know, depending on what type of method you use to raise the, 
the queen, what probably matters more is having a large population of young nurse bees that are well fed with with lots of protein or incoming pollen. And then, of course, later when those queens are going on their mating flights, lots of unrelated drones to mate with. That probably matters a lot more than what type of cell starter finisher or cell builder you decide to use ultimately. Well, let's start, let's talk about setting up and managing the cell builders. Before you begin rearing queens, you need to make sure you have lots of young, healthy, well-fed nurse bees to accept and raise those grafts and drones available to mate with them. I have beekeepers calling me early in the year asking if I have any queens available, and I might be able to, it's might, the weather might be warm enough to start grafting and raising queens, but I might not have enough bees in my colonies to make splits or make build up cell builders, and so I have to wait a couple of weeks. If you're intending to start the year as early as possible, about four or six weeks before you are planning on uh, raising queens, you should feed your support and drone mother and, and cell builder colonies with syrup and then protein supplement uh, if there's not enough incoming pollen. Or you could just wait. Later in the season when there's plenty of incoming resources, the bees are, are willing to raise queens anyway and there's plenty of drones around so you don't need to, to, to provide any types of supplements to try to encourage that to happen earlier than it would. I'm a big believer in paying attention to some of the signs of nature. Uh, the reason is, you know, what I do in western South Dakota might be different than someone in northern Minnesota, and definitely different than someone who is down in uh, Tennessee. Uh, it's also maybe even different depending on what altitude you are. If you're in a place where there's high mountains and you're a little bit higher up in the foothills, you might need to wait a couple of weeks as compared to somebody down in the, down in the plains. When you start seeing lots of dandelions, not the first couple that poke up, but like fields of dandelions, you know that the weather is probably warm enough that you're able to think about uh, grafting queens. But again, pay attention. If you, there's a weather forecast, you know, predicting a couple of weeks of cold weather, maybe you might want to hold off. Once the lilacs are bloomed, then you definitely know that you're going to be ready. That, that's a great indicator plant for those of us up north to know that the queen bee breeding season is upon us. Another sign is when you see enough drones, and so if you see drone pupa and you open them up and they are purple-eyed, as in this photo, by the time, though, if you graft on that, that time frame, if you graft on that day, the drones will have emerged and be mature enough to mate with those queens that will be ready to go on mating flights. Remember that drones take a little bit longer to develop and mature than do queens, and so you need to wait until you have at least drones in your colony or pupa that ha are purple-eyed before you start uh, grafting or, or producing queens through it or whatever method you're going to use. About 8 to 24 hours before the graft, set up your cell starter. Uh, no matter what method you're going to use, make sure there are enough bee nurse bees in there. I cannot stress that enough. Put in combs of honey, pollen, capped brood, one comb of foundation where the bees can secrete extra wax, but make sure there are no open larvae or eggs, otherwise they might decide to raise those into queens and ignore your grafts that you put into, the, into that starter. Shake in lots of nurse bees from open brood from uh, colonies that can spare them, making sure you don't accidentally shake in the queen. When in doubt, feed syrup and protein supplement, and also when in doubt, put in more nurse bees than you think you'll need. And also go back and check the next day too before you put your grafts in there because if the you shook in more older bees and foragers, they will, if it's in the same yard, you didn't move that cell builder to a new yard, they, many of them might fly back to their original colony. And if that's the case, you need to start over and shake in more bees. So then uh, you leave an empty slot available so that the next day you can put in your grafts. And then when you graft, that you can just slide the, the frame with the grafts right into that. And ideally, you like it to have a, a comb of pollen adjacent to it so the bees can uh, have food readily available. And then some capped brood, ideally brood that is uh, in the process of emerging. Sometimes bees will build comb between the cells. It's not a problem, really, other than it's annoying. You have to be careful when you're removing those... Uh, queen cells later when they're ready to be moved and you can sometimes damage queen cells in the process. One way to minimize it is to put at least one frame of undrawn foundation in your cell builder so that the bees have somewhere to secrete wax. 
Another thing I always do is I put a queen excluder over the entrance. I don't know how many times a, a virgin queen was flying in from another colony, and she must have sensed this large queenless cell builder and thought, well, heck, I'm not going back to this little mating nuke over here. I'm going to go in here and, and set up house. And she goes in there, and she'll kill off every single one of your beautiful grafts. And it seems to happen to me almost like once a year I, I, or twice a year, I just forget and get lazy. And you know what they say, those who forget the lessons of the mistakes they learned in the past are doomed to repeat them. So I can't stress this enough. I always have a queen excluder over the entrance so that no flying virgin can fly in from another hive and, and get in there and, and destroy all your grafts. I mean, it's not the end of the world, but you're just going to have to, you know, find that virgin and which, you know, I usually, they're so hard to find unless I'm lucky. I just leave them alone and make that into a new split and I just make up a whole new cell builder. So on the day of the graft, I make sure there's enough bees in the starter when in doubt, shake and more. I keep repeating myself because it's very important to have enough bees. Uh, the bees should be queenless. They should be buzzing and scenting like this one is. And if not, um, I'm worried there's a queen in there. And so I, I look at each comb and look because obviously if there's a queen in there, it, they're not going to accept your grafts. And if you don't remove the queen, they won't accept at any or very few. So then 24 hours after the graft, you know, I put the grafts over a queen excluder, over a queen right colony. Um, if I'm using a cloak board, you know, after those grafts have been accepted, um, then I'll remove the divider board, and I will bring up a frame of young larvae to attract the nurse bees. So when you first made up your cell starter, you did not want to open brood in the that because they would not have accepted your grafts. But 24 hours after the graft was made, then you can because that'll help attract new nurse bees because those grafts have already been accepted and are now being drawn out and the larva is being fed as queen cells. I make sure there's no volunteer queen cells in the finisher so I look at some of the other combs just to make sure and make sure that the queen with empty comb and cap brood is, is kept below. About four or five days after the graft I make sure that I've had a reasonable acceptance. The goal should be 80 to 90 percent. Um, all of us have bad grafts, and so if we if we didn't have a good graft, I try to figure out what happened. You know, did I graft larva that was too old? Did the uh, cell builder need, uh, you know, did it need uh, feeding? You know, did, was there not enough nurse bees? And I, I talk about troubleshooting uh, here in a bit uh, in another presentation. And then 9 to 10 days after the graft, the right queen cells can be handled gently. Uh, you can move them into mating nukes now, or if you use a queen cell incubator, which I will discuss in another presentation, you can put them in there. And about day 12 after you grafted, assuming that you did not graft larva older than, say, 24, 48 hours, they should begin emerging. Um, this will be 16 days or so after the egg was laid. This also will be continued. I'll talk about you know how to set up your mating nukes and all of that, troubleshooting. Uh, queen rearing and, and all of that in other presentations. Since we're talking about cell builders, another question is how often can they be used? I know some folks graft small amounts of queen cells uh, into the cell builder you know, every few days and then as the other queen cells get old enough they keep track of the frame, they remove those and put those uh, cells into mating nukes. Uh, and you can shake in new nurse bees and add captain emerging brood but eventually the cell builder would become full of older bees. And so at that point, uh, you either reunite it back to another colony, or you can just put in a queen cell uh, and let it just requeen itself, let that queen cell emerge, and then uh, you know you can have an, another colony from that colony that you formerly was using as a cell builder. And so uh, that brings us to the end of this presentation. To summarize, you know, the basic requirements for raising queens are a breeder queen from which to get your newly hatched larva, a cell starter, finisher, or builder with a large population of young bees, young nurse bees. They need plenty of incoming pollen and nectar, or if you're unsure, feed them syrup and, and protein supplement. Lots of unrelated drones for mating with the virgin queens. I'll talk about drone management in another presentation. Good weather, warm, sunny weather, so the queens and drones can go out and fly and mate. And then somewhere where you're going to put those newly emerged queens, those queen cells, so that when the queens uh, emerge, they can go on their mating flights. 
typically most of us queen breeders use mating nukes, but if you're going to raise queens on a small scale, you can simply uh, put the ripe queen cell into a full-size colony that you had removed the queen earlier so that the colony can requeen itself. Just remember, no matter what method that you're using to raise queens, bees start queen cells best when there is no queen present under the emergency response, but then they finish queen cells the best when there is a queen present in an overcrowded colony, well-fed colony, lots of incoming resources are being fed through the swarming uh, impulse. Successful queen rearing methods make use of both the emergency response and the overcrowding response. No matter whether you're going to be grafting or using non-grafting methods, whether you're raising five queen cells or 500. Thanks for watching these series of presentations. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, grafting and setting up mating nukes here uh, in a moment.